What a glorious friggin' morning in Sydney we have today. Picture perfect, it's glorious. You just gotta watch out for that little plover down there. And those little buggers can get a little bit cranky depending on what time of year it is. <laughs> just chill out little dude, don't swoop me. I'm enjoying the view. Good morning people, I am Blunty and today of course we are comparing the Pixel 4 XL Google's new flagship Android phone against Apple's new-ish, I mean it's a couple of weeks old, is it new anymore? 11 Pro Max. Uh, I'm going to put the cameras head to head because, well frankly, cameras is, is one of my areas of expertise, particularly with uh, mobile cameras. I shoot a lot on my phone and have done for many, many years now. And of course, by the way, just before we do head off and do the proper video, I will be looking at the new night mode stuff and the astral photography stuff and <laughs> I'm telling you now, oh, it made me make noises. The first couple of shots I did with it, I was like, no way. In fact, I think I've got a shot of it. Let me, let me show you what I'm talking about. Absolute barbarity. What the hell? That's magic. Genuinely black magic. Not science anymore. I feel like it's safe to assume you all know this, but just in case, the Pixel 4 and Pixel 4 XL are the new flagship Android devices from Google themselves that come with pure, unfutzed with Android. And amongst the marketing push for the launch is a strong focus on the camera. Smartphone photography and video sharing being an ever-growing part of our online and social lives, and the Pixel 3 having a very powerful reputation for having one of, if not the best, technical performance for camera hardware on a smartphone amongst its peers. Google claim the Pixel 4 can give you studio-like photos without the studio. Which, frankly, is complete bollocks because one of the things that sets studio photography apart is, you know, full and discreet control over the environment, especially a complete suite of specialist lighting. That is the definition of a studio, and you can't get studio quality photos without a studio because you need the studio stuff to get the effects. You know, without a studio setup, not even a $16,000 Hasselblad will take studio-like photos. Studio-like photos are not the result of the camera, they're the result of the studio setup. What Google are trying to get across with this stupid lie of a marketing line is just to try and get you to associate high-quality images, clean, crisp, sharp, colourful and honest to real life with the cameras on this phone. Of particular note in the Pixel 3's camera rave reviews was its superb low light mode, and Google have doubled down on that with its successor, claiming it can capture rich detail and colour in near complete darkness. And, well, it bloody well does. This shot here of these old stairs, let me tell you, I couldn't even see them with my own eyes. It was so dark, and I'm not exaggerating. They were only a few meters away, and I literally couldn't see them. I put the camera on a tripod, I set it to its night shot mode, and the Pixel 4 automatically recognized what ludicrous buffoonery I was up to, and dropped into its new astrophotography mode, which is an even more powerful low light mode that it only goes into when it knows it's nice and steady on a tripod. And I made a three minute long exposure. Except it wasn't really a three minute long exposure. This is computational low light photography. It's not exactly like when you set a normal camera into long exposure or bulb modes. It's not one continuous exposure where it just kind of stacks up against the sensor additively. It's exposure stacking. It's calculating how to mix the light it's gathering into a photo that looks like it was better lit. It's keeping the sharpness and detail intact, it's figuring out colour, it's mixing and matching exposure values, and it's doing some very clever noise reduction. It's all math and algorithms. M math and algorithms? Algorithms, I'm math, you idiot. Whatever. The iPhone 11 Pro Max, meanwhile, has its own low-light mode, and it too does it with computational assistance. But it does it quite differently. In this case, it let me max out to a mere 30 second exposure time, and its secret mathematic magic is clearly very different to Google's. It's a little bit hard to see the difference in this shot of concrete and grass in this still night air, but if I show you what each camera does to a scene like this, it becomes a little bit easy to see what's going on. While the Pixel 4's result is cleaner, brighter, punchier, and much cooler in the color temperature, it tried to maintain as much detail as possible, but at the expense of the emotion of the shot. It's cold. It's sterile. A little bit clinical. 
while the iPhone's long exposure mode of this same scene has more accurately simulated what a true long exposure from a normal camera might do. The water and clouds are softened and blurred by their natural movement throughout the long exposure time. Apple avoids overly brightening the shadows or artificially boosting color too much, and the result is something much closer to what an experienced photographer might expect from a long exposure nighttime photo of a scene like this from a regular camera. I don't think one approach is inherently the better approach, they each have their pros and cons, but there is a clear and vast difference to the computational trickery at play in each device to make these camera phones do what only a year or two back was so improbable it's hilarious. These are phones taking these pictures. It's insanity. <laughs> I didn't get a chance to get away from the heavy light pollution of Sydney to really put the Pixel Force astrophotography mode to the test. It is specifically crafted to take photos of the night sky like no other smartphone can. But even a 10 minute stroll from the center of the city, still deep within the well of light pollution, it still kind of blew my mind. This phone can see stars I can't with my feeble human photon sensory organ. Seriously, I'm in the middle of Sydney. I look at the night sky, I see maybe a dozen stars. <laughs> look at what this sees. And this astrophotography mode is part of why it doesn't blur long exposure motion like the iPhone does. The Earth, of course, constantly spins under the sky, making it look like the stars are always moving relative to our viewpoint, which is why in astrophotography, you want very sensitive camera sensors to gather as much light as you can, as quickly as you can, so you can get shorter shutter speeds as possible, because unless you're deliberately trying to create a photo with full arcing streaks of light called star trails, Long exposure past about 20 seconds or so will start smearing the star's motion into lines. The iPhone's night mode is restricted to no more than 30 seconds, largely avoiding this issue, while the max exposure I saw the Pixel ask for was an entire three minutes. But as we saw before, during those three minutes, it doesn't blur the motion together. And even with the more common one or two minute exposures I was using for most of these shots, it kept the stars pin sharp. It's really quite remarkable. The other difference between the night modes I noticed as I looked through the embedded data in each image afterwards, the iPhone ramps up ISO sensitivity to 3200, while the Pixel keeps it much, much lower at 56, or up to 186, I think was the biggest one I saw. Both cameras use noise reduction, of course. The Pixel's significantly longer exposures need it because the longer you gather light over an image sensor, the more noise that starts to creep in, and the phone, because high ISO, also creates more noise. Again, both cameras doing the same job or a similar job in very, very different ways. You've probably also noticed there's a huge difference in the color temperature spat out. Apple leans towards the warmer side pretty aggressively and the Pixel is very, very cool. Neither was truly representative to my eyeball experience, but Apple was closer. There's also a difference in shutter lag which is an issue I thought we were well past on camera phones. The, the time between hitting the shutter and the picture being taken is much longer on the Pixel in its night mode. And in specific circumstances, this could mean missing what many photographers call the decisive moment. You want the camera to trigger when you want the camera to trigger, not a few moments afterwards. This boring picture shows this result the clearest. Despite that forklift truck moving barely more than walking pace, it is in a very different spot in both of these shots. And as you may have assumed, yes, I took this photo precisely simultaneously, one phone in each hand and a thumb over each shutter button. The Pixel 4 reacted so slowly, the forklift moved almost two full lengths of itself forward before the image was taken. Granted, this is a very specific situation, and it doesn't do this under regular lighting, of course, but if you're shooting like this, this street photography stuff, or if you're shooting wildlife in low light, this really can mean the difference between getting your shot and having your intended composition completely balked. Again, I thought we were well past this kind of shutter lag on camera phones. It's, it's like from 10 years ago, this kind of behavior. It was really quite frustrating. Low light video, historically the absolute weakest part of any smartphone's camera, well, both phones have made big strides with this year's models, but for me, it's a pretty clear victory to the Pixel 4. It's still a bit cold and very, very clinical out of the camera. I don't really love the look of it. It doesn't feel very, it doesn't feel very organic, does it? But it's certainly cleaner and suffers less easily from noise in the shadows. So with a bit of editing, you certainly can make it feel a bit nicer. And you've got a bit more wiggle room than you do with the low light stuff coming out of the iPhone. The sacrifice, though, is a lot more motion blur as it just tanks its shutter speed down to get these results. And although I'd never use it myself, the digital zoom in low light is an easy win for Apple, keeping in way more detail. 
But what about in the light, where most of us usually take most of our photos? Well, the differences are less stark, but equally distinct. And I'm not so sure the Pixel wins more than it loses this time around. Under the sun in stills mode, it's kind of blow for blow. There's a few slight differences in things like the amount of and aesthetic quality of the natural background blue you get from the lens when you're focusing on a close subject. And tonality and contrast is a bit different, but nothing so great as to draw a line between them in any real way. The Android device does, of course, have one very strong feature over the iPhone, something we've been asking for ages, well, pretty much forever from iOS, native RAW file support. While you can get RAW files from the phone using a few third-party apps, the Pixel 4's default camera app does so just natively if you want it to. So every shot you take, you can spit out a nice little JPEG ready to use and a RAW file ready for more sophisticated editing. I don't know that most people who shoot on smartphones really care that much about RAW files. Even if they always dutifully shoot RAW on their big boy cameras for serious work, but it is without question a great option to have in the back pocket, and one I am still lamenting isn't part of the default camera experience for iPhone. So I'm marking that down as a clear win for the Pixel 4. Aside from that, frankly, I feel like we've reached a point where we can usually just take for granted that the stills mode on a flagship camera phone, in well-lit circumstances, will be anywhere between good and great. But daytime video mode, front and back? Ah, here's where things get less exciting, or more exciting, or at least more interesting, depending on your point of view. Okay, let's have a listen to the mics while we talk about something else that I found kind of, uh... Well, the word I'm looking for is disappointed, really. Now, with the Pixel 4, we don't have the ultra-wide lens uh, that we have on the iPhone 11 Pro and Pro Max and all that sort of stuff, which I love. I love to shoot wide. I've always carried around a little clip-on lens to get extra wide when I want it. Uh, but just having that built in to the new iPhone is fantastic. I've been using it lots. It's not that useful in all conditions because it's, uh, you know, the sensor behind that ultra-wide angle lens is not as good as the main sensor. So light sensitivity is a bit down, the clarity is a bit down, and, and it doesn't autofocus and uh, you know, it's fixed focus and things like that. But when I want to use it, it's still fantastic fun and I get some great shots of it. I've been loving using it for over the past few weeks that I've had the yeah, iPhone 11 Pro Max. So we don't have that on the Pixel. What you're noticing now is also in video mode, it's less wide. This is both, we'll just, we'll just, we'll just wait for the cockatoos to screech past. Little miniature dinosaurs that they are. Uh, lost my train of thought. Right. Both these phones are sitting on exactly the same spot. They're on the same tripod, on the same crossbar, mounted at exactly the same distance. Uh, and as you can see, there is a significant crop in the video mode on the Pixel 4. This isn't present in photos, it's specific to video. So whether or not you care about that, I don't know, but uh, it's a big deal. I mean, if you've ever found yourself doing this, trying to get everything you need into the shot, then you're gonna care about a video crop because it does crop in significantly from what the native sensor and the native lens sees in photo mode. So you're in photo mode, you go, oh, I'll get a snap of that. I might as well take some video too. Switch to video mode, all of a sudden you're, all your framing is different. It's a little bit frustrating and it's something that some cameras I've had in the past have to deal with. Uh, the Panasonic GH4 had a crop in video mode. That was a pain in the ass. So when I switched to the GH5, you know, for my workhorse real camera, my proper camera, uh, it was wonderful not to have that crop when you go into you know, the 4K video mode anymore. There. So rolling back to that kind of limitation, that kind of hamstringing, that kind of slight retardation in, in, in how you use the camera, maybe you don't care about it. I do. It's a pain in the ass. 
Don't know why they did it. Don't know why they thought it was necessary. Don't know why they needed to do it. All I know is in video mode, the iPhone is easier to use when you're just running and gunning because you don't have to think about that extra crop, that extra distance. You just, you know the lens, you know the kind of field of view you're gonna get, you know sort of what it does to compression of distance and things like that. Uh, you don't have to readjust between photo and video mode. If you care about that, let me know. Meanwhile, you've been listening to the both microphones and we've got what sounds like a diesel leaf blower off in the distance. We had the birds before. There's a little bit of traffic noise over there. Uh, which one am I coming through clearer on? Which one sounds more natural? Let me know and then down below because I haven't heard it yet because obviously I'm here doing this. Future Blunty, which will be present Blunty, and then past Blunty from your perspective will have edited this. I've gone cross-eyed. And of lesser import, but still important, is we also see that crop with the telephoto lens. Now with the telephoto lens, you're already pushing in. So it might even be beneficial. You get a slightly longer reach out of your telephoto. That could be a good thing. But it's also a bad thing because again, you're dealing with a different field of view depending on whether you're in stills mode or in video mode. And having to have that sort of framework in your head as you're shooting, especially if you're shooting mixed media, you're shooting photos and videos, you're switching between the two, as I often do. Uh, it's just an extra thing to layer on top of your head when you're thinking about how you're framing up, where you're standing, where your angle needs to be. I would rather not deal with a crop in video mode. Please, Google engineers, uh, no one wants that. Talk to any actual photographer who's had to deal with cropped, uh, vi uh, cropped sensors in video mode on, on various cameras. We all hate it, we don't like working with it. It feels restrictive, it feels pointless. Uh, but yeah, this is what it looks like. The newly wider angle front facing camera on the iPhone is another thing I appreciated about doing what I do with the iPhone and that is this arms length walkie talkie stuff which I need to do sometimes. Uh, don't do it that often with the iPhone but that was mainly because I found the, le the, the, the lens just a little bit too tight to do this comfortably. I didn't like the tighter framing that the selfie camera gave me for the walk and talk video stuff and as you can see the Pixel 4 is that tighter framing. It's not, it's not so bad. Yeah, I could cope with it. It feels like it's a little bit wider than the previous models of iPhone that I was dealing with, but of course, the much more open framing on the, uh, on the front facing camera on the iPhone, uh, the wider angle is better, in my opinion, more useful, in my opinion. Nicer framing for doing this. So you don't feel quite so claustrophobic against me. And uh, as we move to a bit of backlighting here, ooh. Yeah, I think the iPhone's dealing better with that as well. A lot of the time, I have been finding the Pixel 4 dealing with lighting a little bit better, uh, and particularly in high contrast situations. And uh, this is a nice window to talk about the new default function it's got in where you can actually adjust live the uh, shadows and highlights. This is something you've been able to do in photo editing software and video editing software quite some time, especially if you shoot RAW or uh, shoot flat in video mode. You've got a lot of control over your shadows and highlights, but you can do that live on the screen with the Pixel 4 in the default camera app. Um, and it's really quite nice in sort of making sure you're not crossing out the shadows when you don't want to be, or crossing your shadows when you do want to be. Again, nothing you really can't do in post-production, but getting it right in camera is always a bit of a time saver. So points to the Pixel 4 on that one, I think. All right, let me give you a little bit of a live demo. Try and show you what I'm talking about here with this hastily set up. Crappy looking, but uh, very demonstrable shot. So we've got super high contrast here. What I want to get is I want to get the details and the shadows down here. This sort of lovely dew soaked, well, uh, sprinkler soaked. We'll pretend it's dew. It's more romantic if it's dew. Uh, versus the sun we've got coming through the tree branches there. So I'll set up my shot here, both cameras. So on the iPhone, I uh, don't have much choice. I mean, I could use an app to shoot raw or shoot flat and then do it in post, but I can focus here on the little plant. I can fiddle with the exposure a bit. Whoops, I've accidentally zoomed. That's fine. Zoop. There we go. So I could bring the exposure down so I get that little lovely sun flare, or I can push it up and get those sun, uh, the sh shadows. But that's all I've got, which is not bad. We can take a pretty decent photo. We can fiddle with that in post and maybe go black and white, get some tones out of it. That's kind of crap, actually. But over here, on the Pixel phone, what we can do is we can tap our focus. I mean, they, these little controls down the bottom here. 
So you can actually, give me those back, give me those back, thank you. This you can fiddle with your shadows. I'm not sure how well that's coming across on camera right now, but you can boost the shadows up, but you can also bring the high nuts back down again. So you can make that sun flare exaggerated, or you can bring it right down. So you get a little pinpoint sun flare, but still bring up those shadows a little bit more. All the way up, there we go. And we'll snap that. And that, uh, well that's a little bit more useful. Unfortunately, we do not have the same control in video mode. We do have exposure control here in video mode, but that works exactly the same way as the exposure control on the iPhone, where you just sort of touch and hold your focus, and you can slide up and down to drag your exposure up and down. Uh, I kind of like how Google do it though, giving you a separate little control down the bottom here. That's a little more convenient than the way Apple do it. It's a little bit faster to get to, a little bit more intuitive, because it just pops the control up as soon as you try to tap focus on something, but yeah. Yeah. You know what? While we're here, let's have a look at the zoom stuff. Uh, this is a pretty good example of what I was talking about with the crop, just coming back to that for a second. It's exaggerated the closer you get to your subject, of course, so we've got a fairly big crop on the Android here, and a nice wide shot on the iPhone. I think I like the framing on the Android, but the point is the crop is significantly different when you get up close. So let's start playing with the zoom. Let's go straight to the two times zoom on the phone. And we'll do the same on the Android one there. So, yeah, as you can see, let's little, do a little tap to focus. Ooh, a bit of a difference there, isn't there? Ooh, that, that's, that sunlight, that backlighting is not doing any favors for us here. So let's zoom right into the max and see what happens. So, yeah, here's something you can't do on the Pixel 4. Ultra wide angle lens. I mean, I don't know if this is the best shot to show it off with. Let's just re-expose there. That sky is very intense. Let's bring that all the way back down. Let's do the same on the pixel over here. Ooh, that is a bit of a smoother readjustment. Don't mind it. Ooh. Ooh, we get into trouble when we try and darken that right down. Something goes a bit all purple. Hello. I've never seen a camera do that before. What's up? Let me try and bring it right down on the iPhone. Right, right, right down, right down, right down, right down. Uh-huh. Well behaved. All right. Let's go back to the regular field of view, see if we can, yeah, we can go right down, right down, right down. All right, Google, what's going on here? What's all this? What's with that? That's goofy. Don't do that. Tell you what though, would you like to know something the Pixel 4 front-facing camera can do that the iPhone just can't, just won't, not ever, that is actually really useful? And uh, I think a lot of iPhone owners are going to be extremely envious of their Pixel 4 toting friends. You see, while Apple's solution for low light photography and computational low light photography in particular uh, relies on the stabilizer, uh, the optical stabilizer on the lens, which means it's only available on the telephoto and regular wide angle, not the ultra wide angle and not the front facing camera. Google's solution, Google's math for doing slightly wizardy things with low light photography and stacking exposures and denoising and all that sort of stuff. They can do that on any of the cameras, including the front facing camera, which means you can get some really nice, well, if you've got a better face than mine, <laughs> some really nice low light self portrait stuff.
All right, here's a slightly more challenging and more practical, uh, frankly, use for that uh, being able to control your shadows and your highlights separately. Let's go a little, little portrait, because uh, in the background there, let me let me re-expose and show you what's supposed to be back there. Oh, oh, hello. In video mode, where we don't have the separate control over shadows and highlights, the iPhone front-facing camera is still dealing a lot better with these huge contrast differences and the pixel just not so much uh let's get my face back hello how you doing focus on my face again hello there. how you doing um yeah so let's try and do that manually in video man let's uh i can bring the sky down a little bit but i completely lose my face how about the iphone let's manually focus on my face and we'll drag that exposure down yeah doing it manually lose out a bit but if you leave the iPhone to its own devices to sort of automatically adjust for it uh -huh. all right let's go into stills mode and see if we can do better on the pixel because I think we might be able to all right I don't think this is gonna work out so well because we're getting a fair amount of sun glare I can't really show you what I'm doing on the screen but uh, I showed you just a moment ago the portraits just if, if you leave the phones to their own devices but let's see let me get my face in focus here we'll bring those highlights uh, sorry those shadows down Actually, you know what? No, we'll bring the shadows all the way up and then we'll crush out the highlights. Uh, uh, okay, what if I tell the phone to take the ex default exposure for my sort of chest area there? Can we bring those up a little? Bring the sky back down? Yeah, I'm still not quite getting there. So let's take the shot. Do do one. Smile! And let's move over to the iPhone. I'll focus on my face. Bring those shadows or the, the highlights right down there. Yeah, not liking that, but we'll take it anyway. 3, 2, 1. Ah. But yeah, once again, let's just leave it to its own devices. We'll sort of expose for the sky and let the iPhone figure out that it should be uh, exposing my face, because it seems to be doing a pretty good job of that. So, once more, 3, 2, 1, count down. Ah. <laughs> so there we go. So I thought this would be a clear victory for the Pixel, but the iPhone... The front-facing sensor on the iPhone just seems to have a little bit wider dynamic range to begin with, and its automatic adjustment for exposure is a little bit clever in the first place. I'll tell you something I did notice with this, though. Let's see if I can get it to re-trigger. I'm going to camera mode here. No, it's not going to tell me. There it is. Raise camera for better angle. So it's, it's telling me to do the MySpace angle already. It, it, it can somehow tell that it's lower than my eye line and shooting up underneath my nose or something. And everyone looks more flattering with a higher camera angle. So that's that's kind of clever. I'm not sure exactly how it's doing that with face detection or just with its motion sensors it can tell how far off the ground it is or something. I don't know. Interesting little interference with my creative process though. Telling me how I should take my shot instead of letting me decide how I want to take my shot. How dare you, Pixel 4. The presumption of it. The arrogance of it, really. <laughs> uh, but kind of helpful for those who don't know what they're doing, I guess. You could try it. Okay, so that was that was in default camera mode because I didn't want the I didn't want the cameras doing any extra fussing and mussing with it. So let's go and do dedicated portrait mode here and see how we deal with the exposure this time. So let's do the iPhone. Yeah, see the iPhone this time in portrait mode knows that the face is the more important thing and it won't sort of auto adjust for that sky. So let me bring it down manually again and uh, give it a little whack. Surprise! Look. Ooh. Uh, so even that seems to do a slightly better job than the default camera mode where in portrait mode it knows you know the face is the important thing so it tried to keep that in mind what if we do that on this what if we come over here portrait mode and we still get the the dual adjustments here so let's bring those shadows up crush that sky down just a little bit no nah, i'm still blowing out oh well, we're getting a bit fuzzy here too for some reason so uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know, I'll show you these on screen clearer, but it looks like, I don't know, I think I'm going to have to give that one to the iPhone as well. Thanks, thanks for the truck over there for reversing and ruining my audio, by the way. I'm not, I'm not going to retake. I'm dealing with the screeching of the mini dinosaurs in the Australian sky, so you'll cope. You can hear me, right? <laughs> what do you reckon? Vote down below. Ooh, look at all this delicious texture right here. Which phone is going to pick it up better? I'll tell you what else. Battery life, especially when it comes to filming, always been a bit of an issue. 
uh, especially on phones, where you can't just swap out the battery like you can on a proper camera. Uh, yeah, I mean, my iPhone is the one currently connected to the cell network. And then I'm, I'm using data to go to Twitter every now and again, and the uh, Pixel 4 doesn't have anything. It doesn't have a SIM card in it at the moment. I'm not connected to Wi-Fi, and it is still draining the battery much faster. I am at barely 95% on the iPhone right now. Pixel 4, already down to 74%. Oh, and let's not forget, by the way, that for a lot of these shots where I've been in front of the camera, my iPhone has also been wirelessly sending beaming video across to my Apple Watch. So that's, that's another battery drain the Pixel's not dealing with, and the Pixel is still losing on the battery war. I mean, yeesh. So just something else to keep in mind there. Uh, the battery on the Pixel 4 already smaller in capacity, and it is already making a significant difference in how confident I feel shooting with it.